Hi everyone, thank you so much for your patience as we get situated and figure out tech issues as we get this webinar started. Um, my name is Uma Mishra Newberry. I am the Executive Director of Women's March Global. Today uh, marks two years since the beginning of a campaign of arrest of Saudi women human rights defenders. Since May 2018, the Free Saudi Activist Coalition has been advocating for the release of women human rights defenders who were arrested in Saudi Arabia for defying the government's ban on women driving and working to dismantle the male guardianship system. The arrest involved approximately a dozen women human rights defenders, including Lujain al Hathlou, who remains in prison, along with other activists. Reports suggest that these women human rights defenders have been subject to multiple human rights violations under Saudi authority, including electric shocks, flogging, sexual assault, and they have been denied due process. The Free Saudi Activist Coalition, which includes Equality Now, Women's March Global, International Service for Human Rights, Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain, Gulf Center for Human Rights, and Civicus are hosting this webinar to update on the human rights violations suffered by those who remain behind bars in Saudi Arabia, as well as provide a more comprehensive assessment of the state of women human rights in the kingdom. Free Saudi Activist Coalition members will also discuss campaign efforts to date and future plans for advocacy. After this webinar, it will be followed by a Twitter storm, which we will post links to to help raise further awareness. And we invite everyone to join that Twitter storm as well. So I want to turn it over to um, my fantastic group of panelists to just introduce themselves and provide um, information on uh, which organization they are from, their names and um, what they are doing. So I'll start with you, Hala, and unmute you. Thank you, Uma. Um, so my name is Hala Gosteri. I'm an activist and a scholar from Saudi Arabia currently. I'm a fellow uh, at the MIT Center for International Studies. Thank you so much, Hala. Um, Salma? I'm Salman Husseini and I'm working with the International Service for Human Rights, a human rights organization based in Switzerland, and I work on advocacy around the Human Rights Council. Thank you so much, Salma. Masana? Hi, everyone. My name is Masana Ndinga Kanga. I work at Civicus on our Crisis Response Fund, which is a lifeline fund for embattled CSOs, and I lead on our Middle East, North Africa advocacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masana. Riam? Uh, hi, my name is Riam Youssef and I work with the Gulf Center for Human Rights and I'm in charge of the Women and Human Rights Defenders Program in MENA region. Thank you so much, Riam. Hussein? Hi, and this is Hussein Abdullah. I'm the Executive Director of Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain. Uh, we have, uh, we, besides working on Bahrain, we also work on other GCC countries, including Saudi Arabia, both in the congressional advocacy and the human rights uh, in the and in the human rights council thank you so much Hussein. and suad yeah my name is suad abu Daya, and i work for equality now which is a non-governmental international human rights organization working to defend and promote the rights of girls and women in in the around the world uh, including in saudi arabia where we have been campaigning for years to end male guardianship system Thank you so much, Swad. So the way that we will um, present to you on this webinar, everybody is going to present their respective um, topics and positions for about six minutes. We do want to open it up to you all for questions. So if questions come up on the bottom of your screens, if you're watching um, us here on Zoom, you'll see a Q&A. Please post your questions within the Q&A and not in the chat as it's a little bit harder to follow. If you're watching us on YouTube, please uh, post the questions in the chat box on YouTube and we will do our best to get to them. We can't promise that we will get to every question. Um, additionally, we invite you to live tweet as we're talking through this and presenting the current situation for Saudi women human rights defenders. Um, use the hashtag free Saudi activists, hashtag stand with Saudi heroes. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Masana um, to talk through the situation generally of Saudi Arabia um, and also the work of the Civicus Monitor. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Great. Thanks, Uma, and thank you all for this opportunity. Um, Civicus has uh, Civicus Monitor, which is designed to track the civic space conditions in countries across the world. Uh, we have a rating system um, with the methodology that's available at monitor.civicus.org that basically ranks uh, countries in relation to their civic space uh, performance by state and non-state actors, uh, including how open they are, what the rights to freedom of assembly and association and expression are, and the general environment and treatment of human rights defenders. Uh, the case of Saudi Arabia is quite unique. We, we see that even though it's long been rated closed on the Civicus uh, Monitor, for example, you know, uh, this year being the 11th anniversary of the ACPRA, the Association on Civil and Political uh, Rights in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, even 11 years beyond that, that we're still seeing this massive regression in civic space, including mass executions, um, torture, uh, abductions across borders, uh, intimidation online, and a really sophisticated use of intelligence to intimidate civic space actors. Um, and how we define this closure, generally speaking, is um, basically on the fear and violence that the state propagates against its citizens, particularly civil society actors, um, the ways in which state and non-state actors close civic space. So we have a number of instances of activists being approached by ununiformed uh, actors in Saudi Arabia to enforce intimidation, not only on the activists, but on their families and using families and acquaintances uh, through system, complicated systems of intimidation. We also see, for example, high levels of torture, uh, uh, and, and really just a general lack of information, um, a lack of openness and willingness for UN special procedures to engage or visit Saudi Arabia to monitor and assess the system as it is. Um, we see killings, uh, as I mentioned, ma mass executions, including uh, in 2019, the execution of a, a young man who was detained at the age of 13 for participating in a, pro in a protest, um, and just the lack of accountability that the state has in that regard. We also see high levels of censorship um, assembly being curtailed using live arm ammunition um, and a heavily restrictive uh, civic environment that is characterized by fear and intimidation. I think what makes the Saudi Arabia case unique is the extent to which the, the state has been able to push out this uh, new framing of itself as a progressive uh, ally in international development, uh, even though we know that Saudi engagement uh, in civil society space is largely determined by and, and, and engaged through gongos, which are government uh, non-NGOs, non government uh, non non-governmental organizations. So they have government affiliation. And through this affiliation, they're able to push out a message of progression uh, that we've seen extensively, including uh, on the 24th of June, when the right to drive was lifted, uh, was granted to women, uh, the fact that that was celebrated as a progressive step, uh, the so-called end to the male guardianship system in Saudi Arabia, um, extensive engagement with the world of sports, um, with the entertainment world, and I think even a level of impunity with international governments uh, in the G20 uh, who have continued to engage with Saudi Arabia on this agenda of uh, development. And, and what we argue through our analysis on the Civicus Monitor is that you cannot have a development that is exclusive of civic space issues. And so any form of civic space closure ultimately discredits and delegitimizes any process of so-called development. We can then ask the question in Saudi Arabia is who is this development for when we continue to see the detainment of Saudi um, women human rights defenders, including Lujain al-Hutlal, um, also Samar Badawi, 
who is this development for? What is this whitewashing serving? And, and ultimately, I think in, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic we find ourselves in, um, as the whole world stops and takes a reflection on the type of uh, environment that it's built, uh, the type of rights that women's activists and women themselves, their very basic human rights, um, what type of world have we endorsed where we, we've overlooked and uh, choose to turn a blind eye to the massive civic space restrictions and the violence enacted on the bodies of women's rights activists um, who at this moment in the midst of a pandemic should be released um, because they have engaged in nonviolent uh, assembly, nonviolent campaigning for basic human rights and the end to the male guardianship system. And so this is why, in addition to Saudi Arabia just being closed in an of a, the classical definition, um, there is this further regression that really holds, I think, the global political economy in, in massive uh, um, uh, sort of uh, liability to the situation of human rights that, are, that have taken place in Saudi Arabia. Uh, all of these countries are now accomplices to, to this violence. And, and now is the time for something to change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masana. Um, and again, if you have any questions for Masana um, in regards to the work of Civicus Monitor, please post it in the Q&A or in YouTube. Additionally, you can read more on the Civicus Monitor at um, the Free Saudi Activist uh, Advocacy Report that is found at freesaudiactivist.org. So have a look at the more detailed um, review of that. Uh, Suad, I want to turn to you in regards to a discussion on women's equality currently um, on, um, in regards to male guardianship and reforms in Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you, Omar. Thank you, Omar. Um, actually, Equality Now has been working really for years uh, uh, with activists from Saudi Arabia to end male guardianship system. Uh, and uh, the problem is that male guardianship system is controlling uh, every, and every step of, uh, of the daily life of women in Saudi Arabia. Uh, for example, um, um, the father, uh, the, the grandfather, he is the male guardian of a girl, and when she's married, her husband uh, becomes her, um, her guardian. Uh, so, um, and even if a, woman, uh, if a woman's father or husband died, then her brother becomes uh, her, her guardian. So the, the, the system of male guardianship system, in the, the male guardian in Saudi Arabia is really struggling women. Um, and uh, consider them and treat them as legal minors. We have been actually uh, witnessing some legal reforms, I mean, in regard to ending male guardianship system uh, in Saudi Arabia, which is a very, a, a very good step uh, in terms of lifting the ban on, uh, on driving uh, in, uh, to, uh, in, May, in June uh, 2018. Uh, we, we also um, have witnessed some, some changes uh, uh, in regard to that no, lo no longer need the, the women in Saudi Arabia the permission of, uh, of their male uh, guardian uh, to travel, apply for a passport, register a marriage, divorce or childbirth, uh, official family documents. Uh, but uh, still, and this uh, has been... Um, uh, uh, published uh, in, in, a, in a royal degree uh, in August uh, 2019, which is a, a key step towards dismantling control uh, over women. Uh, but still, uh, with, with all these amendments that, that took place, still we think that uh, women are still uh, uh, live under uh, uh, constant uh, male guardian uh, permissions in regard to leaving the prison. For example, if a woman is in a prison, she can't leave the prison until uh, her father or her brother comes and uh, you know take her from there. Exit from a domestic abuse situation, choosing also to marry in addition to her inability to pass on their nation her nationality to her children and spouses. So, and with, with what's going on uh, with um, um, uh, Samar al-Baddawi and Nasima al-Sada and uh, Lujain, 
who are really have been advocating for years for ending male guardianship system. And now we are witnessing some legal reforms in that. So I am not sure why still these women are in prison. So for, for me, I think my personal point of view uh, is that I think Saudi Arabia is, is, is trying uh, to, to please the international uh, community rather than doing genuine reforms in Saudi Arabia. And, um, and I think this because these women are still in prison, they are tortured and they are assaulted and because they were just advocating for women's rights. So I think we, from this uh, webinar, we are calling on the Saudi Arabia uh, and Prince uh, Suleiman uh, to uh, unconditionally release these women from prison. Um, they, they deserve to be treated in dignity without fear and you know, living in a free, free society. And if, if the Saudi government is really uh, genuine about uh, the, the amendments of uh, some of the legal reforms that they have done, then they have to prove to us as a coalition and as international community and for the women in Saudi Arabia that they are genuine in their, in their reforms in regard to releasing these women from prison. Thank you, Oma. Thank you so much, Suad. Um, uh, Hussein, I want to turn to you next um, in regards to the arrest and uh, the trial situation and also the releases that have happened of, of women human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you, Omar. Um, I want to begin by giving you, uh, giving our uh, listeners here an anecdotal, someone from Bahrain, someone from the region. When I sit with any policymaker and they ask me a question about the situation of uh, women and women activists, or basically in general civil society in the Gulf Cooperation Council, I don't find any country that can include in an in, uh, inclusive way all the issues or problems that we face in our region than Saudi Arabia. So my answer usually is just study the situation in Saudi Arabia and look at the issue they go, uh, they go through, whether it's women rights, freedom of expression, extrajudicial killing, ex execution, uh, arbitrary detention, uh, migrant workers, uh, uh, abuses that happens there, access to information and then you basically have you become uh, a knowledgeable or you have enough information to talk about gulf uh, in general um, i also want to give this example when i was in bahrain or i still hear it till uh, well not now not anymore but we used to see score of saudi women coming to bahrain and obtaining driver license because they could not do that in their country now and, and then I remember the Saudi um, uh, uh, ambassador to the UN <clears throat> in New York standing in the middle of the uh, uh, meeting or the United Nations uh, General Assembly building and um, clapping and, and saying, we now give the woman uh, the right to have driver license. I mean, of course, at that time, he thought uh, this is, uh, you know, it's like all of a sudden they found this right and now women have it. This gives you the mentality or give us a, a good reasoning why the attack on women human rights defenders and human rights defenders in general in Saudi Arabia. It is the mentality that I give you the right, you don't have the right to ask me for these universally recognized rights. Uh, uh, these women who are the br brightest light of Saudi Arabia, the courageous women who have uh, fought for the values that we universally hold dear for the benefit for their fellow citizens. They are now punished by uh, uh, a system that is most extreme in the Middle East and North Africa, become instead a fresh declaration of government ab absolutism. Only uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, an elected leader, would decide what changes would uh, be made in the kingdom. So they will make the decision. You cannot ask or demand. So the fear was, or the concern was, that these women now are gaining uh, uh, popularity. They are communicating with diplomats. They are sending emails, messages. Uh, uh, they are writing to uh, 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 different NGO. Uh, 
uh, I remember ADHRB, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, we, we, use, we, we used to receive, and others in, in this group, ISHR, uh, Civicus, used to receive communication from these activists. Uh, some of them actually were courageous enough, and, and, and I, I'm glad they did, despite what they're facing now. Like Summer Bedouin, 2014, she came to the Human Rights Council, delivered, delivered an oral intervention that was interrupted, not once, but probably three times from the Saudi ambassador. And now she's paying the price for that. Uh, because part of her investigation, according to our documentation, was that that who why did you go there or or how how dare you uh, go and, and speak against uh, uh, your country in an uh, international uh, uh, forum? the The treatment, you know the the level of of human rights violation they went through, the Saudi regime, the Saudi government wants to send a message to every activist that yes, we're gonna we might open up a little bit here. We might give you some legal rights that you should have received or it's rec or universally recognized. But look what we have done to these women. And you know, the selection of women is very strategic because for, for a conservative country or for a conservative society, for uh, uh, the prison system or the uh, uh, government authority to be treating them in the way they, they did, whether it comes to sexual harassment, beating, torture, electro electro uh, electrocution, uh, and other uh, ill treatment, send a very uh, concerning and, and, and scary message or fear, uh, a message of fear to any other activist to dare to even go beyond what we're going to give you. So uh, the, the message is we're going to arrest everyone who might ask uh, 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 reform that we're already going to do. The reason because internationally, I, Mohammed bin Salman, or I, the Saudi government, wants to come across like these are things we recognize should have been done and the society was not ready. This is the message. They always been saying the society is not ready. Now, whether that's 100% true, there is some element to it because you have also the traditional Bedouin uh, society. However, uh, uh, the the PR machine of the Saudi government is that uh, 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 we always wanted to do reform. However, uh, the society was not ready. These women human rights defenders actually contradicted that message because they've been asking uh, uh, for these rights for years. I think my time is up. So I just want to uh, uh, point to one thing, and I think um, my colleagues will talk about it that we need to come up with ideas out of the box when it comes to advocacy, especially going after economic interests of the ruling family. Only then maybe we'll be able to uh, attack this culture of impunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hussein. And I know uh, it's inc so incredibly difficult to pack all of that information into six minutes. Um, so I appreciate the, the condensation of it. Um, we am, I, I would like to turn to you next in uh, discussion around uh, especially the work that Gulf Center has been doing in reporting around the uh, torture um, of women human rights defenders. Thank you, Omar. Um, let me start by saying that this anniversary is not only the occasion to mark the unlawful detention of women human rights defenders, but also um, an occasion to remind ourselves of the inadequate measures taken against Saudi Arabia to hold them accountable for the massive human rights violation. Um, I think the Saudi authority not only continue to deny the torture, but also try to use any opportunity um, and any occasion to whitewash the, the human rights violation they keep uh, on committing. Um, so if, uh, if I'm going to start talking about the torture, I, I would like to highlight the report that was issued by the Gulf Center for Human Rights and the joint submission to the Committee Against Torture. Um, so the report was issued by the GCHR into documenting the human rights uh, um, violation and torture in specific um, perpetrated by the Saudi authorities um, against women human rights defenders. Um, the report was very comprehensive and based um, its components on factual background that was um, basically uh, uh, coming out of the CAD proceedings. Um, and the special reporters and special procedures um, reports uh, after visiting Saudi Arabia. Um, it highlighted the issues of torture as one of the main area of concern that the, the Saudi authority um, left undealt with and like um, discarded uh, for so many years. Um, so the allegation we've received were basically of a very, from a very trustworthy um, sources 
and was based on first-hand account, uh, mainly made, made by, by people who, who are um, um, able to give us, uh, to give us uh, such information. The reports confirmed that women human rights defenders were subjected to severe forms of torture in different prisons. Uh, those in um, Jeddah, for example, the Mam An in Riyadh, and in other places that called hotel during the interrogation process or the officer's guest house. So the ill treatment and torture of women human rights defenders um, varied in their types, but uniformed in their cruelty and the severity. Um, the physical torture included, as you said uh, previously, electric shocks, flogging, wiping. Um, on the thighs, and uh, there were a couple of sexual assaults, uh, uh, mainly made uh, to younger women human rights defenders. Um, this included um, like kissing and hugging um, them by, by the interrogators who were uh, most of the time masked, and um, uh, by multiple interrogators. And um, why we're going through like the details of such torture, because I think it's very important not only to read about them, but to remember them again um, and to remember the, the, the gravity of them. Um, and also to remember that these uh, kinds of torture are especially the sexualized and gender based uh, torture are mainly mainstreamed by the Saudi authorities against women um, just to try to silence them and uh, um, punish them for for speaking up and defending women human rights and uh, women human rights in the country. Um, uh, these measures are are mainstreamed in law and practice in Saudi Arabia. So it's it's very important to work um, comprehensively and uh, conclusively on all of these issues in order to deal with uh, uh, the cases of torture and to call um, uh, to the to release of women human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia. Um, women human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia not only detained unlawfully and subjected to unfair trials, as you know, but they were also, some of them were in communicado and we don't have any information about them until the minute. And they were denied their basic rights um, to justice and reparations. Um, they were named and shamed um, before being detained and during uh, the detention, and they were subjected to defamation campaigns, which is very severe and like we, it's, it's another layer of torture and uh, ill treatment uh, perpetrated by the Saudi authorities. Um, if the Saudi authorities were really truthful in, in their changes and reforms, as they claim, they should have um, probably first acknowledged the role of those women um, in making the change and advancing the human rights situation in the country and contributing to the changes, the real changes uh, that took place in the, in the country. Uh, they should have probably rewarded them and appointed them to lead the change in the country by giving them like a couple of positions probably to lead the change. But instead, they tried to um, lock them down and, and, and um, detain them and uh, subject them to uh, torture and human rights violation. Um, there has been several opportunities um, given to the Saudi authorities to release the women human rights defenders in the country. Um, one of them, for example, the latest uh, pandemic that happened globally, and they just denied the, these opportunities. And this stubbornness of, um, that the Saudi Arabia continue to do is just uh, a proof that uh, they probably want to silence the women human rights defenders um, in the country and just to deny them the right and it's just to be um, uh, that Saudi Arabia continue to do their um, um, philanthropist kind of uh, work uh, uh, internationally and trying to to be the upper hand in terms of what, what I can give you but not what you can take. Um, I think um, this is an opportunity for us to remind ourselves of our um, responsibility to protect those women human rights defenders and to work um, proactively uh, in order to release them and remi remi remind the world of, of uh, the type of torture they've been subjected for in order to, to see the changes happening on the ground uh, in terms of advancing human rights uh, situation in the country. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much, Riam. Um, Sam, I would like to turn to you next uh, to discuss the, hum the advocacy efforts that are taking place at the Human Rights Council, among other places as well. 
Thank you. Thank you, Uma. So as we said, the coalition's objective is to push for the immediate and unconditional release and accountability for the torture of the women human rights defenders. And so I'll walk you through some of the key advocacy actions of, of our campaign at the United Nations Human Rights Council. So we lobbied uh, Iceland, who was um, a member of the UN Human Rights Council, uh, who then delivered the first ever joint statement on behalf of 36 states on Saudi Arabia at the Human Rights Council in March 2019. And this really marked a, a, a turning point in, in the, the sense that Saudi Arabia had thought that it would be untouchable at the Human Rights Council. I mean, the, the, the situation in Yemen was discussed, but not the situation uh, domestically. And so this was a very f important first uh, step, and I, and I stress first uh, step. Uh, so the statement condemned the killing of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, demanded accountability, and it called for the release of the activists, and it named 10 of the women's rights activists. Now. In March 2019, the defenders were detained for at least 10 months without a charge or trial. Weeks later, they were referred uh, to court, two were provisionally released, and then in May 2019, five defenders were provisionally released, but they are all uh, facing uh, trial on, on charges based solely on their activism. And of course, there are many other women human rights defenders that are still um, in jail, and, and, and it's very heartbreaking that two years later we still have to demand uh, the release. So this was in March 2019. Now in June 2019, the, one of the, the UN's experts, so the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killing, she presented to the Human Rights Council the results of her investigation into the, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, and she found that the state of Saudi Arabia is responsible for his, her killing, his killing. Um, in her report, she also found credible evidence uh, that Saud al Qahtani, so the former uh, um, uh, former senior advisor to the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, was involved in the killing of, of Khashoggi, and that the same man, so that same person, was physically present during some of the of the women's torture, and he threatened to kill one of uh, one of the women. And so we sent letters to to states at the Human Rights Council, highlighting that connection, and urging them to follow up. Um, on this investigation, and, and we focused on one key recommendation from that report, is that the UN expert said that the, the Saudi government is really serious and it has good and wants to show good faith and commitment that something like this is not going to happen again. Then the first step is that they have to release all of the activists who are detained for exercising um, their human rights. And so we continued lobbied states at the Human Rights Council and especially members of the Human Rights Council because they have a responsibility to hold other members accountable and Saudi Arabia 2019 was a member. And I also pause here to note that they are seeking uh, election again um, for next year. And so Australia in, in September 2019 delivered the second joint statement on Saudi Arabia on behalf of 25 states. And this time it had the support of two non-Western countries for the first time, and this was Honduras and, and Peru. And the statement called for Saudi Arabia to release the activists, to stop all the attacks against and the, and the intimidation of their family members, including travel bans. Um, and it also discussed more generally, the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia, such as the torture, death penalty, and it affirmed that Saudi Arabia as a council member needs to uh, uphold its, its, its obligations. So uh, we also were engaging with the, with the UN experts of, uh, of the Human, human Rights Council and, uh, to, and urged them to, to release a statement marking 500 days of detention for Lujain, which they did. Now, we also lobby, so I, this is about like regarding the Human Rights Council, but we also ask the foreign ministries who have embassies in Riyadh and Saudi Arabia to request to attend the hearings of, uh, of, of the defenders. And they do request it, they're never allowed to enter, but nevertheless, it sends a, a strong um, message of political support for the activists and pressure on the Saudi government. And since Lujain um, 
was, tar was targeted also for engaging with uh, the United Nations, in particular on the Committee um, on the Rights of Women, uh, we lobbied the committee to release a public statement uh, ahead of her last scheduled hearing in March uh, 2020 to push for, for her, her release. So these are just uh, some examples of, of, the, of uh, the efforts that the advocacy efforts that we have been doing. And today we really, the coalition has released an advocacy uh, toolkit that highlights all the timeline of these efforts, the impact and the way forward. What can states and businesses as well do to push um, for the rights activists? The main challenge really that we have now is sustaining this pressure, even though the pressure is not as, as, as much as we would want it to be, but even that minimum pressure that we managed to create in 2019 at the Human Rights Council is difficult to, to, to maintain, to sustain, because the Saudi government is investing a lot to show that it's improving its human rights situation. And unfortunately, some states are buying into that. And so we are continuing, of course, to campaign for the release until all of them are out of jail, until uh, those who torture them are held accountable, until the government apologizes, officially apologizes for the treatment that, that, that it gave to them, um, and to obviously provide them with, uh, with remedy. And, and to those who are watching us right now, we, would, we need your support to be able to, to do that. And I don't know, Uma, if I have a couple of minutes left or... Yeah. Okay. So I, I'll expand on what you know. Those who are watching, what what you can do. First, you can write your government representatives, whether that be the parliament or the, the executive, and ask them to pressure their foreign ministries. So the ministries of foreign affairs, because these are the ministries that make the decision in the government of whether to do something or not to do something. And so you need to write to them and and ask them, what are you doing? To release, to, to call for, uh, to push for the release of the actors. Are you calling publicly for the release? Are you, your government joining the statements and pushing the Human Rights Council to, to do more? So that's for in terms of the of, of the council angle. Now Saudi Arabia is also holding the G20 summit scheduled for November 2020 in Riyadh. So if your governments are participating there, then you also need to ask them to raise this and insist on the release when they all meet with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The information who on who are the G20 countries that are participating is on the web page, but I can just read them out now quickly. So if you are listening and you and you are from these countries and you know that you have uh, uh, a very big um, potential to, 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 to support us. So Jordan, Singapore, Switzerland, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Republic of Korea, South Africa, UK, US, and the European Union. There are other some countries that I don't think they will listen to us, so I took them out. Um, and then, so that's on the, on the country part. Now, on the businesses part, because the, this G20 summit also includes a section where businesses participate. I can't read them all because it's, it's a big list, but you can find it on, on the website. So if you just go on Google and write B20, 2020, you'll, you'll find the, the web page and, uh, and all the companies that are participating. So you need to write, if, if you use any of, of the products of these companies, then write to them on their Twitter or on their Facebook page or whatever medium they use to advertise their products to you and ask them, what are you doing to use your leverage to push for the activist release? We know that the Saudi government is interested and it's looking for investments. Uh, it's looking for, to, to uh, whitewash its image. So how are you using your leverage to push for these activists um, release. And just to conclude, the, the Saudi government has money and resources that we as uh, international society organizations and grassroots uh, activists do not have. All we have is the power of our words, of our solidarity and of our actions. So we really need your support. We are counting on your support to help us pressure the Saudi government to release them. Thank you so much, Selma, for that. Um, and we will be sharing those recommendations that Selma has given along with a complete list of the countries that she noted um, uh, after this, this webinar. Um, Hala, I want to turn to you as a Saudi woman human rights defender um, on your perspective on the situation of women's rights in Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Uma. Uh, thank you for all the speakers for their solidarity and for their uh, support uh, for the women activists in the civil society inside, inside Saudi Arabia. Just to give uh, people who are listening some feel on how it, how it feels for uh, an activist 
uh, to try to push for reforms or to be part of uh, interest groups within their community within Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy, as Selma and other people mentioned. Uh, it's an immune system that is very difficult to penetrate because the government very much controls all aspects of the education, the media, uses religion to suppress its people, and a huge PR machinery and propaganda um, to uh, basically introduce their own narrative on which reforms are uh, underway and why uh, they were selected. And uh, the nature of the Saudi society as very conservative and resisting to any kinds of reforms. Uh, so those women activists really represented a puncture to those, to those narratives. Uh, it punctured not only the narrative that the society isn't ready, that is, the society is more progressive than their own state in uh, demanding, organizing, and building bridges with international community and with, with its own uh, local communities in order to push for the reforms. Now, many of the women who were uh, part of the um, uh, movement who have been targeted uh, during the arrest two years ago uh, were from academia, were writers, were bloggers, were campaigners, uh, not only for uh, abolishing the, uh, the women driving ban, but also uh, in giving women choices. Um, you know, we've actually presented reports and communicated with people who, who can um, help us through resources, uh, not only within the UN, but with civil society organization, with academia, uh, with the greater, uh, you know, uh, cross-national feminist movement. Uh, those kinds of activities were very much unheard of in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, wouldn't have been possible without the effort and support uh, of the women from uh, Saudi Arabia and the, the activists, as mentioned by Hussein and others, uh, the lack of information and, and Suad, the lack of access to information and the transparency from Saudi Arabia uh, made it kind of, you know, like a, a huge opportunity for uh, those monitoring the civil society and reforms within Saudi Arabia. Uh, people who were journalists, people who were um, civic space activists, people who were working in UN and different capacities, uh, academia, people who are working on research to document, you know, the progress of reforms, wouldn't have been able to do those kinds of, um, you know, work, uh, the, expo the, expose, uh, the expose of what's happening within Saudi Arabia without the support and uh, the input of women who put their own lives at risk, many of them with a great personal risk like Samar Bedawi and others who have not been only, uh, you know, supporting the reforms, uh, you know, uh, on, on, uh, on a level of, of, of confronting the state with its own machinery, but also very repressive family background that caused her to spend seven months in prison and when she started, you know, talking about violence against women. So while the women driving uh, thing and the male guardianship has been, the, the rallying call for women activists, but these are, were not the only things that women activists have been working around. They were working around the freedom for association, uh, the freedom of suppression, they've supported political prisoners, the prisoners of conscience. Uh, they've worked around family law and protection from violence. Some of them have created this symbolic uh, funeral for women who have been killed by uh, their family members, just to raise awareness in their own communities of uh, the gravity of the situation and the vulnerability of women without any kinds of uh, support system in place uh, with a very you know, uh, resisting uh, authority to any kinds of change. Uh, they've actually endured a lot of defamation even before the arrests. Uh, since 1990, women have been enduring a lot of personal assassination by the media, by the religious clerics controlled by the state. Uh, they've been banned from pursuing certain careers. They've been uh, you know, placed under arbitrary uh, uh, travel bans so that to restrict their connection with uh, the women movements at large or the international community. Uh, now, the, the attack that happened two years ago was very much unprecedented. Why is that? It was not only because of the nature of uh, how this ha has been uh, fueling this kind of, you know, um, new nationalism where uh, a nationalist uh, 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 agenda uh, involves uh, no um, uh, criti critique whatsoever of Mohammed bin Salman or the leaders but also in um, banning anyone who has an influence from uh, you know, uh, gaining any kinds of uh, credibility uh, at the eyes of others, uh, putting or framing their own activity as human rights activists who have been lobbying and their own community and the international community for support, you know, framing all those kinds of activity as acts of treason and justifying why those people have to be eliminated from the general discussions on uh, public affairs or uh, reforms. Um, now, that very much quietened the society of Saudi Arabia, the emerging and uh, 
the uh, budding uh, you know, society in Saudi Arabia who were calling for uh, more reforms and holding the government accountable and not only changing the laws, the discriminatory laws, but also in implementing it in ways that is responsive to uh, women needs. In the guardianship system, for instance, there are uh, now uh, two things that are, despite all kinds of reforms, two things that can be used by guardians to block women's access to any kinds of those newly founded reforms. Uh, the, the man decided to uh, prevent women from leaving their homes on charges of disobedience. Uh, or if a man uh, goes and says that she's absent from home, if she chooses to, she chooses to um, escape violent uh, you know, or abusive homes or to choose to work in a different country. Uh, those kinds of cases are very much like allowed by the, by the religious courts in Saudi Arabia and can very much restrict women's access to any kinds of reforms. Now, uh, things like the life-saving abortion, things like uh, women's choice to have invasive procedure that could affect the reproductive um, functions, uh, women getting released from different places, uh, governmental institutions with their correctional facilities uh, or uh, rehabilitation centers, uh, women, for instance, who were um, unable to, um, uh, to, to get a, a support for in, in cases of violence, um, they don't have any means basically to um, to uh, get the, the, the support that they used to have through the women activists, through the voices being amplified by the women activists. In fact, one of the main uh, things that have, been, that have been pursued by women activists is establishing non-governmental organization. And this became one of the charges against them uh, for protection from violence. Um, you know, the abuse that happened to the women, this kind of large defamation campaign uh, and the uh, impunity of the state, uh, you know, against any kinds of accountability. It's not only, uh, you know, um, evident from the continued uh, detention and trials of those who were released, but also from the lack of response to any kinds of international uh, pleas or international uh, support for their release. And we do believe that this is something related to um, the rise of authoritarianism and the support that the Saudi uh, leaders are getting because of the money. Uh, we see uh, an opportunity now uh, with the uh, downturn of the economy inside Saudi because of the reduced oil prices, because of the COVID-19. Uh, the economic situation within Saudi Arabia allows for more engagement uh, on, on, on this level and realization that uh, the best bet for any country, the best bet for the civil society across the world is to support people who are um, you know, uh, acting for the rights and freedom rather than oppressive leaders. And I will just stop here and... Uh, you know, um, end with this note, uh, please support the women activists. And we see, we've see we seen that this helped at the beginning by releasing some of them. Uh, so we, we really want to keep doing what we're doing and to uh, seize the opportunities, as I said, uh, that could be conducive to the release. Thank you so much, Hala. Um, thank you to, to all of you who have, who have spoken. We have a few questions that have uh, come in off of YouTube and, um, and then one that has come in via Zoom. We are not going to be able to get to all of them just in the interest of time as we are starting our tweet storm in about six minutes. But Lewis, to your question, someone just answered it. Um, yes, we are also horrified to see that Saudi Arabia is a member of the UN Women's Executive Board. Um, they are also, for those who don't know, up for um, or going up for re-election in October um, to the Human Rights Council. Um, and also they are hosting the G20. So there are lots of opportunities um, for accountability measures to be put into place by the general public, by governments, by businesses. And that is what we as a coalition are trying to say. So some has answered your question and hopefully that, that answers it. If there's any other questions around this, we are going to be publishing exactly what Selma has said in terms of the recommendations that you as a member of the general public can take and we will publish them on our coalition website one of the questions that I wanted to um, follow up um, with in terms of uh, uh, reforms is, are the reforms in Saudi Arabia a pos positive step forward? This is a question that's come in um, through YouTube. Uh, Hala, I will direct that one to you. You're, you're unmuted. Uh, I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. Should you read the question or? Oh yes, the question was: um, Are the are the reforms in Saudi Arabia an actual positive step forward? Yes, yes, there are reforms in Saudi Arabia, and some of those reforms are very much like much needed because they were reforms that were highlighted by the women movement within Saudi by the, the work of those women activists. Um, they were focused on. Previously, we had reforms which were very much like 
uh, opening cinemas and uh, having concerts and things like that. But the actual reforms that gained the recognition and the support of the Saudi society is lifting the women driving ban, allowing women to have trans uh, passports, travel without a consent, which doesn't protect her from disobedience charges or, or absence from home. Uh, but again, all those kinds of steps were petitioned by the women, uh, you know, uh, repeatedly. Uh, so we do believe that those reforms that are happening which are very positive uh, wouldn't have been happening without high being highlighted as much needed by the women activists. So there is a progress, but making sure that this uh, that these reforms are implemented, making sure that it really improves the lives of every single woman, not only some groups of women who are uh, very much like part of the workforce, because we do sense that many of those reforms were aimed towards uh, easing the restrictions uh, for women access to the workforce. This is more of an economic in in intent uh, rather than um, would uh, improve the lives uh, and, and uh, freedoms and, and choices of all women uh, without any kinds of discrimination. So this is why we need continuing support of the women activists of the, of the civil society to make sure that those reforms are uh, affecting all the women and responsive to all, to every every uh, you know women's needs, rather than only for economic prosperity or economic uh, you know uh, generating revenues for the state. Thank you so much, Halep. Um, so, did you want to add to that question as well? As I know, this is a lot of uh, qualities now. Go qualities now work. Uh, yes, uh, Uma. Thank you. Yes, I I, I see that uh, in Saudi Arabia that ha that they have done some legal reforms, but I am really hoping, hoping that these reforms are implemented because, for example, if I want to give the example of the lifting on the ban, uh, they have done that, but uh, as reports came from Saudi Arabia, suggests that women, they have to pay double the fees in, uh, in the driving uh, issue. So we want really to see the implementation of these laws on, on, uh, in practice and real. Thank you so much, Suad. Um, I see a couple more questions coming in and unfortunately we only have two minutes left and I want to really direct you to um, moving online and taking action. So I want to just go over and first of all, say a, a massive thank you to all of our panelists and to the incredible work of the, of the coalition. Um, we're gonna to get to one more question just because it's come up. Um, Masana, can you take the question that has come up on um, COVID? So the question is how has SARS uh, and COVID-19 uh, affected the situation in regards to quarantine and economic ramifications? Masana. Right, so of course, across the world, we're seeing that there is a massive effect on economic livelihoods and just livelihoods, um, not just for uh, those who are part of the working class, but I think within that, the gender dynamics of this discrimination. So much like uh, Saudi women already experienced this discrimination and equal participation in the economy, what we're really pushing for is for just participation and just livelihoods within the situation. And our biggest worry as we've been tracking the COVID-19 response is much like the anti-terrorism laws, like the anti-terrorism law of 2017 in Saudi has been used to curtail the activism in civic space of civil society actors, that the surveillance and the outspread of the state uh, with unlimited powers to further use the system to discriminate against activists will be on the horizon. And so we really urge people, even in their calls, um, as states are rolling out surveillance, um, in, encouraging lockdowns for the purposes of health and the double-edged sword, then is using those restrictions similarly to restrict freedom of association, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly, is that there does need to be a sense of accountability around what that looks like for a, a, a closed and repressed of regime like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And so even in those calls when we're speaking about COVID-19, as prisoners are being released, as we saw in Bahrain, they're not releasing the nonviolent activists who have been campaigning for civic rights. And so essentially what this has done is it's basically uh, completely delegitimized even those calls for freedom of assembly association and expression within the COVID-19 era. So we do need to keep our eyes out for the ramifications um, on civic space. 
Thank you so much, Masana, and thank you again to everybody who has joined. I want to quickly um, point you all to our website. Thank you um, to all of our panelists um, before I jump to this for your time. Um, you all can please direct yourselves to freesaudiactivist.org. On this website right now, we are going to be starting our um, tweet storm. So if you scroll down, you can see um, speak out tweet storm in English and Arabic, and we have uh, all of the tweets and posts and graphics that you will need for the next hour, please join us. One of the most important things that we have learned as um, activists and defenders and people that are working within this space is that silence is complicity and it is our responsibility as Hala has said to continue speaking out. Um, so click onto our website, freesaudiactivist.org. Our advocacy document is also um, posted as well and there's an English and Arabic version on that you have the timeline and also recommendations that you can follow up on and feel free to DM you know, our organizations on Twitter to follow up with us. Thank you everybody so much. Thank you. Thank you.